Well, good morning. morning. How many NFL fans do we have here? All right. How many NFL fans believe that referees are 100% objective and always make the call based on what they see and not based on the influence of the fans or the players or the coaches? It is really silent in here. Um, Yeah, in fact, if you are dubious, you have good reason. A study by Michael Lopez, a researcher and statistician at Skidmore College in New York, found that referees are much more likely to make a call in the favor of the home crowd or the screaming coaches and players on the sideline closest to the potential play. Studied five years of NFL films, over 1,400 penalties, and that was a conclusion that they arrived at. In short, he revealed intimidation works. Yell at refs, get in their face, and they are more likely to cave to social pressure. By the way, those of you who are ACC fans know this has been, this is called Duke basketball by the way, right? At any rate, those of you, some of you appreciated that a little bit. But anyway, he said social pressure is a powerful force. And it takes a special kind of person to stand up to it. Are you that special kind of person? Do you have the courage to stand up against social pressure? If there's one theme that has seemed to emerge this year as we've gone through our messages The one thing that God has been saying to me has been that God is doing amazing things in our time. Despite the chaos, the troubles in the world, despite COVID, the Bible tells us that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine through His power that is at work within us. God wants to do amazing things through you. And the good news is He can use all kinds of people. He can use the young and the old. The educated, the uneducated, the sophisticated, the not sophisticated, the the, the redneck, the urbane, the short, occasionally God can even use the tall. Sometimes he can even use cat lovers, I've heard, okay, occasionally. But if there's one group that God cannot use, it is those who crumble under social pressure. It's those who run. It's those who lack courage. But the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind or sound judgment. That is why one of Jesus' most frequent commands in the Bible, one of the most frequent commands is, do not be afraid. Have courage. John chapter 16, verse 35, Jesus says to them, I have told you these things, so that in me, that you, you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. There will be pressure on you in this world. But be courageous, he says. I've overcome the worlds. So today, how do we develop Jesus-style courage? Jesus loves courage, despite social pressures to crumble. What I'd like for us to do is take a look at a couple examples from Jesus' life, watch his example, and then learn some lessons about how we can develop that same kind of courage so that God can do through us what he wants in this generation. Boy, we need God to work through this generation. Boy, we need God to work through you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, do something in this time. Speak to us, change hearts, break through defenses, break through denials, that you might be honored. Our desire is to seek your face and nothing else is through Christ we pray. Amen. God is going to change lives today through his message. He's promised that he will through his word. And I hope you won't miss the change that he wants. So I want to ask you to take some notes on one specific thing. Listen for the actions that God wants you to take today and write them down and then commit them to somebody else. You can send them to us if you want, but better yet, your small group or somebody you're accountable to, you say, hey, this is the action I'm committed to and, and then tell them what you do and share with them what God does. 
Dale Carnegie said, inaction breeds doubt and fear. Inaction breeds doubt and fear. In other words, if you listen to this message and don't do anything, you'll actually increase your trepidation, your lack of courage. Action breeds confidence and courage. If you want to conquer fear, do not sit home and think about it. Go out and get busy. So let's go out and get busy and be like Jesus. First example we see of Jesus is that Jesus had courage under pressure to stand despite the pressure to conform. Luke chapter 5 verse 33 says that some opponents came to Jesus and said, John's disciples fast often and say prayers, and those of the Pharisees do the same, but yours eat and drink. Now, I'm not quite sure the last time you got into a major conflict over fasting. My guess is it's probably been a week or two. But it tells you something about the importance of fasting in those days that the religious leaders were calling Jesus on the carpet because he and his disciples were not conforming to their standards of fasting. See, while the Old Testament explicitly commanded one day of fasting, Day of Atonement, and there were other days that could be called, the modern-day religious people of Jesus' day, the leaders, the Pharisees, had turned it into a legalistic thing, where in the Old Testament, the purpose of fasting is to help us draw closer to God. They had turned it into a virtue signaling, a way to demonstrate how superior they are spiritually. Um, And so they were pressuring Jesus to conform to this as well. Jesus gave an example of this kind of approach to fasting and prayer in Luke chapter 18, where he told the story of a Pharisee and a tax collector going to the temple. He said that the, the, the Pharisee prayed like this to himself, about himself. I think that's kind of funny. He prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. See, they didn't fast just once a year or occasionally when it was called. Every Monday, every Thursday, they fasted. And I give a tenth of everything I get. You notice the I language there? He's not praying to God. He's praying about himself. I, 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 I thank you. God, you know, I'm like this. Second thing, notice the boundary markers. Sociologists define boundary markers as highly visible, relatively superficial practices that allow people to distinguish who is inside and who is outside the camp. Boundary markers are are, are virtue signaling. Things that people say, things that we people do, relatively superficial, they don't actually demand character or change or sacrifice. But relatively superficial, but by signaling this, they are signaling, I am part of the cool kids, and you are not. God, I thank you that I'm not like those other people, those adulterers, those people that don't tithe, those people that don't fast twice a week. It's not about, they've lost the whole point of tithing and fasting, which is to get closer to God, and have turned it into spiritual junior high, you know? Virtue signaling, I'm on the inside. This is the core of Jesus' confrontation with the religious leaders here in John chapter 5. It's not really about fasting. It's about who sets the rules and why do they exist? Do the Pharisees set the rules or does God set the rules? Does Jesus? Are rules personal? This is my truth. Is it societal? This is what society says. The religious society says you ought to do to be cool. Or are we standing firm on what the Bible says? On what God has said about things like fasting? Jesus isn't violating any of God's laws on fasting. And it takes courage to stand on God's truth when the world would tell you to conform to society standards. I think of a seamstress, a member of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, a Christ follower, who understood the truth of God that all people are created in the image of God. She understood that there 
is no such thing as race says, that race says are a creation of human being. There's one race, the human race. We all bleed red. We're all made in the image of God. We are all equal in God's sight and valuable in God's sight because of bearing his image. She understood the evil nature of dividing people by externals. And so, on a December morning, 1955, when a bus driver asked her to move, she stood her ground. The bus driver asked her to take a different seat because there was a white person that wanted that seat. She would not budge. That next Monday night, 10,000 followers of Christ gathered together in a church to pray God, what do you want us to do next? God, what does it mean for us to stand for your truth in love when the world tells us to move, to conform? And Rosa Parks ignited a revolution all because a mild-mannered, soft-spoken Christ follower seamstress stood with Christ when it was unpopular. when the world would say, conform. Jeremiah 6.16 says, This is what the Lord says, Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient paths, which way to what is good. Then take it and find rest for yourselves. But they protested, we won't. Sometimes people ask me, why are so many Christians conservative? And the answer, one answer is right here. In Jeremiah 6.16, the definition of being conservative is you're not always chasing the next new idea that is untested and, but socially popular. You're always looking to the ancient paths, saying what has God commanded, what has God said, what has God blessed, what has God defined, and how do we apply those principles? How do we apply those truths in our present situation But there are always the people that protest. No, we don't want to do things God's way. We're smarter. We're progressive. The angry critics protest Jesus. And Jesus responds boldly. You can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. And then they will fast in those days. Jesus pushes back from the social pressure by reminding them of the truth, telling them of the truth. Again, the point of fasting is to draw close to God. And Jesus basically says, why would they fast while the groom is here, while God is with them? I'm here. Basically, Jesus says, I'm the life of the party. As long as the party's here, why do they fast? There'll come a time when I'm gone, when I'm when I send them to heaven. And then those times they will fast to get closer to me. But now I am here. And it's a wonderful picture. I mean, couldn't you imagine? If Jesus basically says, now imagine that you've gone to a wedding and everybody's sitting at the reception afterward waiting for the meal and the party. And as everybody waits, the father of the bride comes out. Oh, and did I tell you, by the way, the father of the bride is a preacher. He's a pastor. And he says, you know, usually at these wedding feasts, there's gluttony and bacchanalia, you know, singing and laughing and partying and dancing and potential for sin going on. I don't think that's the, but I think the more spiritual way to send off our bride and groom, rather than all of that kind of stuff, we're going to spend the next four hours fasting and praying for them. Don't you think that'd be the spiritual thing to do? So everybody, let's get on our knees right now and fast and pray. What would you think if you went to a wedding reception like that? Would you think, man, this is the most spiritual wedding reception I've ever been to? I'll tell you what I'd think. I'd think, I've always known that pastors are cheapskates, (laughs) but this is ridiculous. Jesus says, this is not the time for fasting. This is the time for joy. So you all need to lighten up on your rules and focus on the substance. But that takes courage to stand for the truth when the world would pressure you to conform. 
And it takes a special kind of person to have that kind of courage like Jesus did. I was thinking about Karen Pence, the former vice president's wife, who took a job at Emmanuel Christian School in Springfield. Now, they're a Bible. That's a good church, the Emmanuel Christian Church. It's a good school. They believe what the Bible teaches about the sanctity of gender and the sanctity of marriage. But liberals attacked her. People magazine wrote, Vice President's wife is teaching at an anti-gay Christian school. And then the rest of the choir joined in. CBS News, New York Times, Washington Post, the left establishment, all attacked her. But she stood her ground when the world said, conform to our new standards if you want to be part of the cool kids. Dr. Paul Church was expelled from his medical staff in, at the Beth Israel Medical Center in Boston where he was practicing medicine for the last 25 year, 28 years because he spoke about the health risks of homosexual behavior. He spoke the truth and he lost his job. It takes courage to stand when a world changes the rules by their own authority and tells you to conform. The House has passed H.R. 5, the Equality Act, which turns sexual orientation and gender identity into a protected class. Abortion as a right, civil right. That would make it illegal for Christian organizations to live by biblical standards. Open up Christian organizations and churches to be sued if they dare not conform to the new standards of society. You know, I grew up, the days I grew up, Billy Graham was respected. He was honored. Today, if Billy Graham were to preach what he preached when I was growing up, he would be called homophobic, a misogynist, a preacher of hate. And God's truth has not changed. God's love has not budged an iota. But it takes courage to be like Jesus and to not crumble when social pressures change the lines. I think it takes a lot of courage to be a young person in school today and not cheat when the tests or the answers to the tests are being passed around. It takes courage for young people to not be part of the family life education teaching in Fairfax County, which teaches you know six-year-olds that to consider you know transitioning when they're going to be ostracized by kids and even maybe by teachers because they don't conform to society's new standards. It took courage for Roseanne Russell, one of my mentors, to share Jesus boldly in the workplace even though she was ridiculed by it. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, everybody who will acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Thomas Watson, Jr., chairman of IBM, one time said, if, if a person stands up and is counted, from time to time he will get knocked down. But remember, the one who gets flattened by an opponent can get up again. But the one who's flattened by conformity stays down for good. What stand has God been calling you to take that you have not taken because you've been afraid? Is there anything that you know that God has been wanting you to say that you have not said because you've lacked the fear it takes a special person not to give in when the crowds are screaming 
against you. But Jesus was that kind of person. He stood for truth, God's truth and love, when the world said conform. It also takes courage to be flexible and gracious when the world is rigid and inflexible. Verse 36, Jesus told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and then puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. You don't put a new unwashed garment patch on an old garment because when the whole thing gets washed, not only won't the two match up, but the the, the new will shrink and you'll have a hole and it'll be a mess. The second parable is like at verse 37. And nobody puts, nobody puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will spill out and the skins will be ruined. No, you put fre- new wine into fresh wineskins. See, back in, in old times, they would put new wine in new leather bottles. And then when the wine, new wine would ferment and the gases would cause it to expand, the new leather bottles would expand with it. But if you would put new wine in old wineskins, the old wineskins over time would grow uh, brittle and easily break. And so you put new wine in old wineskins, the wineskins can't expand, they break, all the wine spills out. Jesus is saying to them, I have come to be new wine for new wineskins. The old wineskins were good wineskins. The old law was good for the reason God gave it. Understand, the Bible never says that the Old Testament law is bad. It accomplished all that God wanted it to accomplish. It communicated God's character. It communicated what is loving and what's not loving, what's good and what's evil, so we're not having to hunch it. It established the nation of Israel as with national laws. It established the worship of Israel with worship laws. It shows us It prepares us for Christ, the Messiah. It shows us just how much we sin and how much we need a Savior. The old wineskins were really good to accomplish what God wanted them to accomplish. But over time, not only are they not ready for the fulfillment of the law in Jesus Christ, but the Pharisees have made the laws brittle, inflexible. For instance, the Old Testament, the Bible says, Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then there are a couple of other laws that clarify what it means to keep the Sabbath holy, not to do work on the Sabbath. That wasn't enough for the religious leaders. Over time, they needed more clarity. They needed more details. And so they came up with more details. 39 categories of Sabbath laws with hundreds of specific laws under them. When Jesus is accused of breaking Sabbath laws. He never breaks the Old Testament Sabbath laws. He's always violating one of these hundreds of made-up, man-made laws. Again, see the common nature here. Whose rules are we following? Whose law do we follow? Who's, who's defining what's good and evil? Is it God or is it society? Is it my personal truth? Jesus never violates God's truth. We see this example then in Jesus' life in verse one of chapter six on Sabbath, Jesus passed through the grain fields and his disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating them. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Um, Again, what they did was lawful in every way. They weren't upset, by the way. The Pharisees weren't upset because they were picking grain. Gleaning laws are legal in Israel to this day. They were upset because the day on which they were doing that they t- picked grain and rubbed them in their fingers and ate them. And because of that, they accused the followers of Jesus of breaking the Sabbath laws that you can't make a meal during Sabbath. That's making a meal during Sabbath? Not according to the Old Testament, but according to their made up marker, uh, uh, boundary markers. So they said, Why are your followers doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? You know, legalists are miserable people. You ever notice that? H.L. Mencken had a great definition for, for, for Puritanism. He said, Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, might be having a good time. It's kind of like the world that we're starting to live in today. I, I heard about one cult that by the time it ended, they had like six members. They had six members, 
But, but you know what? One of their laws was total abstinence. All sex is bad. Kind of makes you wonder why nobody wanted to be a part of that cult, doesn't it? And why they couldn't go on very... Pharisees were just that inflexible and that, just that miserable. But Jesus courageously responds to their inflexibility and their lack of graciousness by giving them a Sabbath history lesson. Verse, again, he returns them to the Bible. Verse 3. He said, haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat? He even gave some to those who were with them. They're foisted on their own petard. Jesus says, don't you remember David? See, David is one of their heroes. David is the one who envisions the temple. David is the one, when the Messiah comes, he will reign on David's throne. David is the great one who's, you know, close to the heart of God. He says, you don't condemn David. Don't you remember when David was hungry with his men and was on the, and they went to the, they went to the, to, to the, to the priest Ahimelech and asked him if there was any food and Ahimelech couldn't find any food. And so he went to the the 12 loaves of bread that were set aside just for the priests to eat, but Ahimelech didn't think it was wrong for David and his men to eat that bread. And God didn't condemn David for that. And you don't condemn David for that. That is so much closer to the violation of law than what I'm doing. You know, why don't you just lighten up? Why do you criticize David? Don't you criticize David? But you criticize me. Now, people today would call this whataboutism. You know, people who want to shut you down sometimes say, oh, that's just whataboutism. No, it's pointing out hypocrisy. That's what it is. Jesus showed great courage in verse 5 when he went on to say, oh, and by the way, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Do you understand what he's saying? First of all, he's claiming to be the Son of Man, that one prophesied by Ezekiel and Daniel. And then he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I made the Sabbath. I wrote the rules of Sabbath. If anybody ought to know what is inside and outside Sabbath restrictions, the writer of the Sabbath laws should know that. So you all ought to lighten up. New wines, new wineskins, listen to me. It takes courage to be flexible when the world around you, when the culture puts the pressure on you to be harsh and intolerant. You know, I, I used to have to preach this message to Christians, and I still do some. But you know, we live in times when our world around us is increasingly pressuring us to be intolerant, and it's happening fast. You know, who ever thought that Dr. Seuss books would be bad? You know, <laughs> I, I, last, last service, I, it's, you know how intolerant our world is? Last service, I said something about Dr. Seuss's books being banned because he's been taken off bookshelves. Because, you know, Loudoun County is not promoting anymore like they used to. The president, you know, took him off the list for this reading kind of thing. And because I used to, somebody on our chat was criticizing me. Oh no, they didn't ban Dr. Seuss's book. Well, they're taking them off the shelf. So defensive for a lost world and their intolerance, missing the point. Is it really so? Here's the craziness of our world. It's okay for family life education classes to teach our six years old six year olds to consider transitioning, but it's not okay for them. We've got to take Dr. Seuss away from them. What kind of crazy world? of intolerance do we live in? There was a time when people liked to quote Voltaire who said, I may disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Not so much anymore. Now people are glad if you disagree with what they believe. If you disagree with what the virtue signalers have said are virtuous, if you want to be on the inside part of the cool kids, it's okay for you to be banned. I don't agree with a lot of what Dr. Seuss says or what he believes, but really we can't have a little grace? Does it not concern us at all that they're taking names of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson off of schools? 
the D.C. committee has voted to remove the names of Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe and Andrew Jackson from government buildings. See, there used to be a time where we could be gracious and we could say, those people were not perfect, but I'm not perfect. But they did some good stuff too. And I hope that when I'm remembered, I'm not just remembered for the bad stuff that I do, that I can also be appreciated for the blessings that I gave but not in an intolerant world that wants to virtue signal and say, this is how I can say I'm better than other people because I fast twice a week because I condemn those people from the past. And you know what? It's causing some of us to be afraid to speak. I'm sometimes afraid to speak because... um, I am only concerned about honoring God and teaching the Bible and helping people walk closer to God. But I know today the world has become so political that if I teach Bible things that touch on political things, some people are going to accuse me of being defending Republicans. I don't want to be associated with the Republicans. They're corrupt. But I do want to teach God's word. I do want to teach God's truth. Last year, I I had a friend say, Brett, I know you're not racist, but when you say that, you're racist. You you know what I said? Talking about the racial tensions in our world, I said, do you remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. Let that sink in. Joseph's very brothers sold him into slavery, but he forgave them. And later on, actually, after the father died... The brothers were like, okay, now Joseph is going to get revenge on us. Now he's going to come for our pound of fle- his pound of flesh. And so they come to Joseph and say, Joseph, now are you going to get revenge? And Joseph weeps at the thought that they would think that he would want to get back at them. And remember what Joseph says? Joseph says, what you intended, what S- Satan intended this for evil. But God intended it for good. God redeemed this. And I said, do you not think that that a biblical approach to some of these things would be to say, Satan intended this for evil. It was evil what was done to slaves. It It was evil what was done with Jim Crow. And I need to repent for my evil. But isn't redemption going to come when people start saying, Satan intended this for good, but God, for evil, but God can use it for the good? And no, I'm not going to hold it against you. And I even hesitate to say that today because when I shared that with people that I love and trust, they said, Brett, you know, you, you, you have no idea how racist that sounds. Because in a world that changes the standards and sets them up by human social standards, there's pressure to conform and be intolerant and ungracious. Well, what do we learn from Jesus' example so that we can have courage under pressure? A couple of things that I want to share with you just real quickly. Um, And in fact, I will share more of this this week in devotions. Four things we learn from Jesus' example so we can be courageous as he was courageous. The first, the first key to courage, I don't like that. The first key to courage is God's presence. Okay? Jesus said, man, I wonder why there's that delay. Um, Why is it that Jesus could be courageous? It's because he knew he was doing God's will. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. If you are out on your own, if you're acting on your own, there is no courage. But if you know you're just doing what God wants, there's courage. There was a time in the history of New Life when we were really young. There were only about 25 people who were part of the core of the church. We were just a couple of weeks old. And, And a woman came up to me after the service and said, Brett, you offended me today. 
Now, you need to understand that this woman and her husband were the only people over 30 years old, the only people, I think they were in their 40s, they were the only people that had any money that could give anything really to financially support the church and keep us going. And she came up to me and said, Brett, you offended me today. And I wasn't quite sure if she was serious or not, because who has a serious conversation about being offended over school locker rooms? But anyway, school lockers, I mean, but uh, she's, I, okay, I said, oh, how did I offend you? She said, you let women serve communion today. And I laughed out loud because I knew she was joking. She didn't get the giggle. Okay, she was, I was laughing. She was not, she was frowning. She was not happy. I said, are you serious? She said, yeah. She said, I'm serious. I said, really? I said, well, we're a Bible-based church. And as a Bible-based church, we, tr- we do, try to do our best to do things the Bible ways, teach what the Bible teaches, practice what the Bible practices. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says who can serve communion and who can't. Well, she says, and she went back into her tradition about it. In her tradition, only men served communion and why they... I said, that's fine. But we're a Bible-based church. We're not based on man-made traditions. And this is a... And they left the church. I knew, I had a pretty good idea that they were not going to stay in the church as a result of that... That really didn't take a lot of courage for me. Why? Because I knew I was underneath the presence of God. It's not my church. It's his. It's not my Bible. It's his. It's not my will. It's his. Why is it that I can preach stuff? Why do I say stuff that I think you all can accuse me and people in chat will will argue with me about? It's because I really don't care what you think. Actually, that's a lie. I do care about what you think about me. But it's because ultimately... I care about what God thinks. I, I care about being under his presence. Courage is found when Jesus Christ is Lord of your life and you say, all to Jesus I surrender. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, the place of courage begins by saying, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Be my shepherd. And then you walk underneath his shepherding every day. Second, courage continues as we walk in God's word. Now, Jesus, whoa, yes, you can help me by going back to wherever we were. God's, by God's word. Why is it that Jesus had such people? It's because he knew the truth. And he stood firmly in God's truth. When they were changing the rules, he knew your rules are wrong. Your rules are not loving. Your rules are not gracious. God's truth brings freedom. God's truth is love. And so he was able to stand firm in that because he was firm. I guess if you don't know what God's love is, if you don't know what God's word is, you're not going to be sure what God's love is. If you don't know what God's love is, you're not going to be, I'm sorry, if you're not clear on what God's word is, you're not going to be clear on where God gives freedom, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Jesus said, Jesus said, I've come that you might have freedom. And so know God's word. What action do you need to take this week? And who do you need to be accountable to? so that you will know God's word. Number three, know God's people. Be connected to God's people. I love the old illustration. I know it's kind of old fashioned, but it's the illustration of the ember. You take that ember and you place it in a fire beside other hot embers and it will grow and it will warm the house and it will bring light into the room. But you take that very same ember and you isolate it And eventually it'll cool until it dies. Sometimes we lack courage because we isolate ourselves. Because we neglect time with our Christian friends. Because we neglect time in worship. Um, So what action do you need to take to be connected to the fire that is God's people? And finally... um, we have courage when we focus on God's win. Any of you invested right now in GameStop stock? Okay, my son is. Um, he's hoping to make enough money to buy a car with the money he makes off of it. I hope he makes enough money so that I can retire <laughs> off of it, quite frankly. What if you knew the end of the story? What, what if you knew, if you invested enough money in GameStop stock today, you could make 
$2 million. Would you do it today? You'd have confidence if you knew the end of the, the, end of the game. Why is it that we lack confidence sometimes? It's because we lack confidence in who's going to win. And the world would try to bully you by saying, you're on the wrong side of history. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And so we live in fear. But the Bible tells us how the story ends. That Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, will one day return. And one day we will know He is Lord of all. And so I live submitted to Him, walking with Him, confident in Him, because whatever happens to me in this time, I win in Christ. Now, we are not a part of a winning team that wants anybody else to lose. We're part of a winning team. Our heart breaks when people haven't won in Christ. And so part of the challenge is, do you have the courage to share the love and truth of Jesus with somebody this week? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and I pray that you would make us a courageous people. Purify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Strengthen us in your love. Although on the prophets... Help us know what it means to love you and to love people. Lord, we repent for our lack of courage up to this point. Um, I know I need to repent for doubting you and not loving people enough and wanting to be liked more than wanting to love people with the love that you have. Lord, make us your people. Make us strong. Make us like Christ for your glory. It's through Christ I pray these things. Amen.